Grown and Greek presents part one of our three-part series called The Divine Agenda. I'm your host, Faith Frazier. Today, you will meet our panel of D9 thought leaders assembled together in order to drive solutions to issues in our communities. They are dynamic in their own lanes, but together, our goal is through this conversation, we will develop a roadmap and a plan of action to distribute to our grown and Greek family in order to implement the changes that will impact the next generation. So let's meet them. Demetrius McCoy, a brother of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Demetrius is a community leader with a heart to inspire the next generation and motivate individuals into their purpose and destiny. He holds a master's degree from Bernal University and serves in DeKalb County, Georgia as the Chief of Staff to Commissioner Marita Davis Johnson. He is also the Senior Pastor of Word of Life Christian Church at the Life Center Church in Decatur. He is married to the love of his life, Mariah, and dad to Demetrius Jr. Anne Lucy Chakrura, a sister of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Lucy is the Houston, Texas-based principal of the NLC Law Group, where she represents and assists individuals, businesses, and legal professionals in labor and employment law, business and commercial law, personal injury, premises liability, and admin hearings. She holds her cum laude JD from Thurgood Marshall School of Law, and she is a professed college football enthusiast loyal to the Oklahoma Sooners, where she received her BS in psychology. Ada Luce Pla Williams, a sister of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She's an actor, writer, producer, Puerto Rican born and Bronx, New York raised, currently residing in Los Angeles, California. Along with her husband, Doug, who you will meet shortly, co-founded DNA Media Productions, a platform to tell stories that reflect diversity and inclusion. She has been seen on shows like Jane the Virgin, Grey's Anatomy, and the FX series Maya's MC as Cecilia, Coco's mom, which got her shortlisted for a 2019 Emmy. Catch her now on the Netflix hit series On My Block. Doug Williams, Omega Man, actor, husband, and Montgomery, Alabama native, now based in Los Angeles, California, who is the first black comedian to create, host, and produce his own stand-up comedy series, and the Stars Network's first original hit series, Martin Lawrence Presents First Amendment Stand-Up. Doug has guest starred on The Bernie Mac Show and the HBO series, The Mind of the Married Man. He will soon be starring in the upcoming feature film, The Trace, with Billy D. Williams and Lynn Whitfield. Brandy Avery, affectionately known as B, is a sister of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, residing in Columbus, Ohio. She is the founder and CEO of the Financial Power Network, LLC, a social fintech firm that combines tech and social entrepreneurship to develop B2B consultative and financial education and economic initiatives designed to close the wealth gap. Her work has expanded her territory as she is the co-founder of Keys to Black Wealth, which we'll hear about later, and as the author of the four-week financial power plan. Dr. LeVar Smith a brother of Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, representing the ATL, received his PhD in political science from Miami University. Currently, he is the assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at his undergraduate alma mater, Morehouse College. His research focuses on issues of state development, international political economy, and democratization of sub-Sahara Africa. Latoya Bell represents the so sweet sisterhood of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. She is mom to Zoe and has dedicated her career to public service as an attorney. She currently serves as the municipal chief for the Hamilton County Clerk of Courts in Cincinnati, Ohio. She is known throughout parts of Maryland and Kentucky as a fierce criminal defense attorney for her work as a public defender. She has extended her passion to even serve on the social action committee of her Beta Zeta Zeta chapter. Danielle West serves as the Chief Administrative Officer and Director of the Queen City Academy Charter School. She is a pro skilled in the nonprofit sector, procuring funds through grants, credentialed in community organizing, coaching, and education management. Under her leadership, she has increased scholar enrollment from kindergarten to third grades, and she managed a $1.1 million school renovation project. 
from bidding to completion in order to accommodate the school's expansion. She holds a master's degree in educational administration from St. Peter's College, and she represents the pink and green of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Meredith Lilly, attorney, experienced community organizer, Alpha Kappa Alpha woman, and a sought after campaign manager who started her political career in 2007 with the Obama for America campaign as the regional political director, managing multiple campaign offices in several states across the nation. Upon this success in 2008, she received a presidential appointment from the White House as the senior advisor to the regional administrator of the U.S. General Service Administration. She currently resides in the ATL and serves as director of external affairs for DeKalb County in CEO Mike Thurman's administration. Todd Morris, Mr. Blue Fi in a cowboy hat, holds a bachelor's degree in communication from Miles College, and he spent 12 years working in radio until he ran off to join the Universal Circus as a national tour promoter, who is responsible for marketing the brand in multiple cities across the country. Currently, Todd serves as the implementation specialist at Wide Orbit Inc., and he's the president of the Pi Upsilon Sigma chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated in Birmingham, Alabama. He is a twin, and he owns a Tennessee walking horse named Shades of Grey. Thanks for joining us. This is Grown and Greek Presents The Divine Agenda. Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today um, on Grown and Greek TV. And um, I am so honored to uh, be in your company. Um, I think um, hopefully your intros did you uh, some, some justice in just telling everybody how amazing you guys are. So um, we'll, we'll just dive on in. Um, thank you. Um, let me say first off to uh, Demetrius who um, prayed over this conversation prior to, and um, I want to also let everyone know that we um, did our best to have the whole D9 represented. Um, we are minus a Kappa and we're minus a Sigma, Sigma Gamma Rho uh, today, but because of the conversations that we will uh, continue to have, we will have in uh, the end, all of the D9 represented. So they just couldn't join this uh, particular conversation, but it's all good. So um, the way that I want to kind of paint this is you guys jump in. Um, we'll try to go around the room um, to, to make sure that, you know, everyone has a, a chance to express themselves, but we'll just dive right in and um, whoever wants to take the reins to, to speak, please feel free to do that. But the, the idea of this conversation, obviously, is to try to define what an agenda is. You know, there are a lot of um, conversations going on. There obviously protesting uh, being done. There's obviously, um, you know, a lot of um, all kinds of emotions in everything. But I think the uh, thing that we can do as a D9 is to, you know, try to band together to come up with uh, some solutions. I'm all about solutions. I'm all about, you know, you give, give us a problem and we, we try to solve it. And so, you know, I thank you again for being a part of this conversation and um, the efforts to try to do that. And so um, just going with uh, my first question, first idea, first topic, what do you guys think um, is the black agenda and more importantly, a black Greek agenda? And where can we find it? What is it? Um, how, can, how can we come together today to start writing those things out? I think um, one of the things is getting back to the basics. Um, one thing that we talk about and that I've been talking about with Phi Beta Sigma for the past year and a half, two years, um, getting back to the basics. Um, and when I say back to the basics, I'm talking about we got to remember that they're the, the foot soldiers, those that started this um, civil rights and pushed for us to have the rights we have today, we got to think about they were praying leaders. They were involved in the church they were doing things in the community so we got to get back to the church number one we got to continue to put god first but then on top of that we have got to be involved in our community we have got to get more involved in our communities a lot of times we hear the conversation but we never see action 
And that's one of the things that I, you know, I say we got to get back to the basics. We got to continue to live and build on the foundation that was set for us. So if it, without the basics, we're still going to continue to be a lost people. So there's a lot of things that can be done, but then we have to come together as one. And of course, I have some things that I'll share later on. I don't want to over talk here, but I have a few things that I'll share later on that um, we've been discussing amongst our ranks. Todd, I want to jump in right there because uh, you said something that I think was very profound, which is getting back to the basics. And, you know, uh, Faith, as we were preparing for this, you know, we talked about that a lot of the things that we will discuss and say today, many of us are doing. Uh, some people don't know that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I will mention that uh, I pastor a very small church, a congregation of about 75 uh, to 125 people. And in the midst of uh, what's happening in our in our world in terms of unrest, we still have a pandemic going on where folks have lost their jobs. They don't have food to eat. They still are looking for the very basic of things. And, you know, I was challenged because I said, well, I pastor a small church. Well, what can we do? You know, and for a minute, for, I thought that we couldn't do anything. But today we fed at least 80 families and provided them groceries. And it, and it, it really just starts with starting somewhere. You know, do what you can with what you have uh, to serve those people who are in need. And, and I think that uh, if we all do that collectively, that we can continue to grow and make a, better, a larger impact uh, as we take the initiative and first step. I think the Black agenda is the ask that we're baking that we shouldn't have to ask. The basics, as has been said, quality health care, education, justice, equal application of the law. That's for me the agenda and the collective approach is making sure that <laughs> consistently addressing each agenda item and not losing sight. So right now, police brutality is, a, is at the forefront, but again, let's not forget about the pandemic and quality health care and education. That's gonna change what that looks like for us going forward. So making sure again, we don't lose sight because what's at the forefront doesn't warrant us forgetting about the collective of issues. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I would love to chime in here as well. And I think um, to Latoya's point, I think that the whole I, and I'm gonna push back just a little bit um, on the whole idea of a black agenda. And I think um, I'm doing this in one way because um, what we've been given in America since time immemorial is an agenda of how we should be seen or how we should be treated as black people. And I think one of the things that often gets overlooked, and this is definitely in the vein of white supremacy, is agency. What we ourselves are doing as a people, we're, we're, if we think about Tulsa, if we think about Black Wall Street, right? we've been a people who have been resilient despite the odds. Our organizations reflect that. So I think one of the things that we need to really start doing is really having critical conversations among black people um, about what transformation actually looks like in black communities, right? And when we talk about things like healthcare, right? Um, things of um, equal access to opportunity in terms of education, um, police brutality, right? Um, these are the things that undergird the death of George Floyd, but we're not looking at um, closely, right? We're outraged by his um, death, but we're not looking at the circumstances, the political, social, and economic circumstances that led him to be in that position in the first place. And I think that one of the things that we have to constantly do as organizations, but also as Black people, is talking the language of transformation. What do we want this society to look like for us? And then how do we move in a direction that then not just allows us to put an agenda on the table and say, right, to those in power, right, here's the demands that we have, but we're going to implement these demands anyway, even if our needs isn't met. And this goes back to, again, what Mr. Uh, what Todd said about the whole idea of bringing it back to the core of who we are, right? And finding ways to develop these sustainable systems of black agency and power, regardless of what, right, um, what system exists anyway. And I think that that has been the hallmark of who we are as a people. And I think that that is something that is currently missing in our, in our, in our new conversations. Um, you know, especially in this in this new age of social movement. I'm gonna so, jump in. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go go ahead. I'm 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 gonna. Um, I want you to say what you want to say, but um, I I want to piggyback off of. I'm gonna piggyback right off of um, this uh, question. As you know, once you um, once you finish, Lucy. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I think 
in addition to what everyone has said, I just want to bring um, an angle to it that I think a lot of us, we just conceded the question, which is what is a black agenda? First of all, there has to be meaningful recognition that we are not a monolith. Mm -hmm. So the idea that one thing fixes it all is conceding to white supremacy as far as I'm concerned. We are not a monolith. Um, there has to be me meaningful recognition of that. You know, society has carved out groups for quote unquote white America. You know, we have the soccer moms, we have evangelicals, we have um, middle class voters. Those are euphemisms for white Americans. And so when we say the black agenda, um, it, 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 it's fraught for me because it's almost where we're pulled together only by the color of our skin. There's no recognition about socioeconomic status. There's no recognition about descendancy. I'm an African immigrant here, yet anybody looking at me only sees a black person. Right. So the first thing is to recognize that that question is a fraught question. And we, as the people asking that question need to recognize that we run the range like any other group in this country. And so, you know, when it comes to the black agenda for me, the circumstance of the black man in the United States of America, the first thing that has to be done is there has to be the payment of the debt that is owed to the black man in this country, and that's reparations. If that is not the top thing on any agenda, I don't know what we're having a conversation about. This country will not move forward until that debt is paid. Every violation of humanity that this country has done to anybody else has been paid from Jews to Japanese to Native Americans. The debt that is owed to the black man in this country must be paid. So if we are going to talk about an agenda, and I speak about that in the terms of bring your agenda to a meeting, not conceding that African Americans are a monolith, that's the first thing, that's topmost. And then after that, you know, we have to have a meaningful, um, we have to have meaningful access to the economy. You know, that's, that's another thing, e education, other things that have been mentioned, restorative uh, justice, criminal justice reform, education, there runs a whole gamut of things that needs to be talked about. But first and foremost for me is a conversation that acknowledges that the reason we are all here is because there remains a debt that needs to be paid. That conversation is not something that can be shied away from. It, it needs to be acknowledged. And while we're waiting for all the studies and commissions that are being done as to what reparations, what form it should take, um, we need to uh, pressure for meaningful access to all the systems in this country. And African-Americans have to recognize that until they gain leverage, they must participate. You cannot demand if you have no leverage. And maybe that's the attorney in me, but you must first build leverage before you can demand. So that's- Econ yeah. Economics is gonna be the key to it's anything that you're doing in life. If, if we can jump in, we haven't uh, been able to comment on the subject. Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, in listening to everybody, uh, kind of validates what I've always said, uh, which is that we need to have a meeting of the minds because everybody, has so many ideas and everybody has what works for them and this and you know I'm, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama and I'm a big time student of the civil rights movement at its inception, uh, the organizing of it. Uh, there's a great book that I would encourage everybody to read that uh, didn't got a lot of negative press because Reverend Abernathy kind of exposed uh, you know or said some things about Dr. King and the message got lost uh, about how they organize and how they strategize. But uh, having said that, and it's called uh, And the Walls Came Tumbling Down. But having said that, I think we need a meeting of the minds. Uh, and it starts with the divine nine because collectively we have so much power. We yeah. are a, a vast number uh, that a force to be reckoned with because this country revolves around voting and public officials and people who are elected to represent us. So we need to have a collective uh, meeting of the minds, set an agenda, and then take that agenda forward. And based on our numbers, uh, we're, we, we have to be heard. We are forced to be reckoned with. So I think that, you know, listening to everybody, this is the problem is that everybody has what they want to focus on. We have to become one voice and we have to prioritize 
yeah. how we want to move forward and what things need to be done first in the same vein that they did uh, in the civil rights, uh, with the civil rights movement. And if I may add to what, what everyone has already, has already said, um, I think one of the things that was mentioned is that we are already uh, doing what we are doing separately. Right. Um, and I know that you have mentioned, um, Faith, that uh, how can we do that in our communities? Well, we are already having social gatherings uh, with the Divine Nine in, in, different, in different settings. What we can start doing is having uh, meetings about the issues that we want to tackle within our communities um, and bring those issues in. I know for me, one of the things that I'm passionate about is education. Aside from being an artist, you know, to me, the biggest arsenal that we can have besides, you know, putting God and his will first is education. Right. And one of the things that's always bothered me in, in, in this country in particular is that um, not only are we facing racial disparities in the education system, but disciplinary actions start within primary schools. I know that uh, black and brown kids are always being sent first to the office for, for the many issues that, that are very similar to the, to the white kids. You know, they don't get sent to the, or they have records or they are arrested for the same issue. So I think we need to, we need to start having those discussions. You know, education is power. We have to empower and, and grow the love of learning, the thirst for learning, the thirst for knowledge. And that is your key arsenal to being able to, to, to get ahead and, and be able to overcome uh, uh, racial disparities and disciplinary actions, you know, I think. So we'll, we'll continue with this particular um, topic question, but uh, let, me, let me just say this, let me throw this in here. Um, the whole motivation uh, behind this conversation, and again, we'll have um, a couple of other ones to tack on to this one, but it is to begin to write that document. You know, it is to be able to put some things down on paper so that, you know, what we do as a D9 is defined, um, you know, and again, it's, it's awesome that we do do things uh, individually and amongst our organizations and within our organizations, but the numbers don't lie. Like collectively, we are a tremendous force. There are too many of us <laughs> in this world that are about the same mission uh, that we shouldn't be doing something collectively. Um, and yes, it's probably easier said than done, but at least, you know, from this conversation, we can start writing those things down. And you know, the written word is, it seals it. Yeah. And so um, I want to, you know, put that out there, that that's something that I'm going to do uh, with you, for you. And um, I hope that, you know, by you guys being here today, um, it says enough for me that you're on board too. So, you know, I want you to be processing it and thinking about it and whatever those things are for us to be able to put those things on paper. That's, that's what we're going to do from this, from this, this is a beginning. This is a Genesis. And I think that that's powerful. Um, I think that again, um, you know, creating a living document that then again sets an agenda for where we see ourselves, but most importantly, where we want to see our communities um, is so vital and so powerful. But I want to um, also kind of go back and kind of reinforce the importance of history here. I mean, we've had these documents before. I mean, yeah. if you remember the early 2000s, we actually had the covenant with Black America with Tata Smiley and Cornell West that actually kind of set an agenda of what, right, Black America wanted and the way it should look, right? Yeah. And I think that this also attests to the resilience of white supremacy. Um, in the sense that, again, right, um, there is this idea, as Lucy talked about, that Black people are a monolith, that their ideas are the same. And I think that one of the things that we need to do if we're really thinking about creating a living document, but most importantly, implementing it and practicing communities, is also find ways to engage not just the D9, but also other stakeholders, right? So Demetrius, as a man of faith, and Todd, as a men of faith, how do we engage black men in having the deep conversations about how we treat our women and how we actually lead our families, right? Um, that's, that's critical, right? Especially yeah. in this emphasis on black men. Um, but most importantly, how do we engage the church to then also reinforce the values of, all, of Black Lives Matter, right? So again, how do we actually extend that as Lucy was talking about to the African diaspora? 
um, you know, as a professor of political science that focuses on Africa and international affairs, um, what we understand is that there is protest about Black Lives Matter in Brazil, in India, in South Africa. So again, there's global connections to the type of movement that we have here. And partly because the world gets its cues from what America and how America actually treats its people, um, particularly Black people. Right. So the world gets its cues on democracy, human rights and justice on how we are treated. So, again, I think that that also is important in terms of being able to make global connections, as Lucy talks about, and being able to spread the idea of who we are and what we want to a broader global community, too. So, so um, Carl, what, um, whatever the agenda is, I think that we should not get caught up on the agenda being um, just one single approach, right? It needs to be multifaceted. And in that approach, we need to tackle education. We need to tackle systemic issues. We need to tackle and talk about how do we build black wealth um, again. All of those things need to be hit at, at simultaneously. They cannot be something that we just have a very narrow view and say, hey, let's just laser in focus on systematic racism and breaking down all the walls of systematic racism. It needs to be multifaceted where we look at across the board. We look at education. We look at healthcare, We look at building black wealth. We look at um, different agendas and points of view. I remember in, I think it was Future of the Race by Cornell West and Henry Louis Gates Jr. They talked about building our communities again. And they talked about the guys on the corner really being participants in building the community and buying, ultimately buying back the block, essentially very similar to that approach. All of that needs to be combined in what our agenda is. Our agenda can no longer be just one item and one, one mission that we're focused on because that's uh, the protest of the day, right? It has to be this time an approach where we just embody all that affects us as a people. Um, and that means no matter whether you are from the African diaspora, or you are an, a, a Black American born, born here in America. I think we have to look at us as a totality and move that agenda forward, um, but just from varying approaches. Thank yeah, you. I'd like to add in um, real briefly um, in, re in regards to the Black agenda. Um, one of the more, most important things, and I think also one of the most challenging things that we're uh, facing is um, just a collaborative approach. Mm -hmm. um, there are so much creativity within the Black community all across the board, and we're talking about Black, um, of course, my organization is Keys to Black Wealth, and that includes the diaspora. Um, that's the reason why we didn't call it Keys to African American Wealth, it's Keys to Black Wealth, because it does in um, include um, well beyond the United States of America and our borders, but it's the collective approach. Um, there's so much creativity within the Black community, and there's so many lanes that people are um, crossing over in and then constantly there is a, rep a, a repetition of organizations and like organizations is being brought up, you know, every single day. There's like 20 of everything. Um, and while that's great, what it does is it spreads our resources thin and then it does um, create these silos that we see. And I think that's one thing that the D9 has, a, I guess, a special um, place in is that we're able to um, kind of lean on our history and the tradition of um, you know, what our principles say. And that might be something that you know, our positioning is as a DNI is, is bringing that collective approach back because if we continue to operate in the silos, then we're not gonna have a sense of collectiveness, which means that our resources are spread thin and we may not even be aware of all the resources that's readily available to us. Um, so I think that that has to be at the foundation of our agenda uh, well beyond the D9 is um, figuring out a way to create some type of collective approach uh, within the overall Black community. I mean, I know that's a big task to undertake, but I just feel like that's going to be where our power lies is when we can come together as a community of people and really be able to say, okay, what do we have? Who are our key leaders? Uh, what resources do we have? And who's going to be the chiefs of these resources? And then who's going to be the followers? Who's going to be the Indians of the resources, if you will? But that's something that I just feel like we need to look at overall within the Black community is breaking down the silos and having a more collective approach um, to all of everything we discussed today, whether it's systematic racism, the institutionalized racism, all of the above. We, um, we struggle with that. We struggle with coming together as a collective and sharing our resources and our wealth with one another. And and one of the things um, we discussed this past week, we hosted a press conference for the unaffiliated concerned voters here in Birmingham um, as a part of the Jefferson, St. Clair, Walker, Shelby County area. 
we discuss a nine point uh, plan that uh, Dr. Tyree Anderson and our committee put together. And with that, it's gonna start with legislation. We gotta have some legislation that's gonna support these things and we gotta improve the policies. And, and, and it's gotta be policies where law enforcement and that personnel, they're gonna properly be trained and then they're also going to be held accountable in those things. And then, um, and I'm going to just go over a couple of these points for you. Um, it's a nine point agenda and there's two points that are Alabama specific, but I think this entire thing, it, it, it's a, when he was pinning this, I don't think the committee, when they were all going over this, they didn't think globally, they were, we were looking here at Alabama and what we can do at, during these times. And one is starting with legislation. Another is removing um, any exception clause that protects law enforcement. Another is established um, civilian oversight committees. And we gotta have these committees to work from our local to our state to our national level. We have to have these committees in place to work on behalf of our people so we can further impact our communities. And then we have to properly, um, when we're speaking about economics, we gotta look at our communities and look at these food deserts. There's a lot of communities that are being impacted by food desert. A lot of times when, when you're struggling in your own community and you're having to go outside your community to spend money, that further distresses your community. We have to start doing things, investing in our community. So a grocery store, imagine if we had grocery stores in our black community, how empowering that would be to have some black owned grocery stores. There's some black owned, um, some grocery chains out there, but imagine if we had that in our communities, how impactful that would be not having to the, the one or two um, white uh, grocery stores in our communities We're, and our having that involvement. And then um, develop um, um, equitable partnerships to empower the minority. Like when our kids are graduating high school, everybody's not going to college. So there's, um, as Dr. Anderson said, you know, these kids got, we have to make sure that they're developing a trade. We got to make sure that we're getting them involved and offering them something aside from the street hustle. A lot of times when kids graduate, if they're sitting in the community, guess what? They're just sitting there and I don't mind. We, we have to acknowledge that it's the devil's workshop. So with that, we have to start investing in these kids and showing them and helping them discover what their potential is, what their strengths are. And, and I have a, a few more points that I could share with you all at a certain point. I'll share them with, um, with um, Faith and we can try and share this as a community, you know, and I know this is only a few of us on here and we have family and friends that are joining and watching us, but the more that we dig down into our communities and get involved, and then you speak about that black love, um, Doug, Ada, I applaud you for um, joining together on this call. Because the thing about it is what our young men see at home, as, as you ask about how we're gonna, um, uh, LeVar, as you ask about how we're gonna teach our young men how to treat our women and then teach them to, to be loving and, and show that, have that affection, the way that we do that, they gotta see it in the home. They've got to see it in the home. And our girls, let's not, if our girls see mama being what then and, and I don't I don't I don't beat up on hip hop. I love hip hop. But then this new music with these kids, the vocabulary, mm, you know, you can you can't use the B or the H or the W, however you want to pronounce it or spell it. You can't use those words to speak endearment to our young ladies. Our young ladies have to stop using those words to speak endearment to one another. We want to we don't want to be called the N word by other people. So we have to stop using it as endearment to one another. So in order for us to build on that platform, the agenda, we have to share that and expose that in the home and then make sure that we're teaching our young men and young women how to interact with the, with the law enforcement. When they have a situation, they got to know how to behave. So we have to have conversations at home. So the most important thing is, we have to exemplify and display it at home. Uh, pastor, I know the, as well as my pastor, our kid, they can't wait to see daddy praying at church. They got to see daddy praying at home. They got to see daddy praying in the car. So mm -hmm. whatever they're seeing at home, that's what they're going to portray. So we just have to make sure that we allow 
ourselves to be viewed by our children first mm -hmm. and our community first. Let me let me jump in uh, right there. Tom. And I, I want to say something too, uh, Faith, okay. when you get that. Okay, no no problem. But um, let's let's uh, let me throw this one out there, and we'll just we'll just keep flowing. But um, one thing that I wanted to kind of piggyback off of uh, what we've been talking about is, you know, I know that we have to have laws passed in order for things to be implemented um, the the right way, quote unquote, right? But what can we do without laws? Like, what can we do today? You know, why, 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 who says that we have to have laws passed or put on the books in order for things to start moving and progressing forward? Um, you know, B mentioned that we have, we're so talented, we're so creative, we have so many resources, um, we, we have access. There, there are so many levels to our abilities to uh, push an agenda forward. Why do we have to wait for the law to say that we are allowed to do that? So think about that and then uh, go ahead, Demetrius. <laughs> yeah, I just I just wanted to say, and Todd, you keep holding up those cue cards that say, Pastor, it's your turn to speak. <laughs> because you say something that sort of that puts me off. But you talked about legislation and really holding folks accountable who are elected. Uh, one of the things that we've done here in DeKalb is we recognize that the district we have um, has the second highest dropout rate. And so what we did was partner with some of the businesses to say, hey, all of our kids are not going to go to college, you know, because we're well different. Uh, there was a time where it was pushed that if you, you know, don't go to college, you got to go to the military, do something. But there we are so talented, so skilled that, you know, now you can get a trade and make more money than some college graduates. Um, and so one of the things we've done is built a collaborative partnership uh, for a GD program as well as apprenticeship program. And these are some of the basic things that we've got to do is, is uh, Ada said it, that education, we, education is not just uh, to, through the K through 12 school or just college. There's so many different ways uh, that we've got to do with education. And then also I wanted to talk about as we're putting the agenda together, I think it's very important for us to recognize the agenda is not just for us. Right. The agenda is for the right. one year old you know, child that, that, that we discussed or for the future generations of us, we're thinking about it. I think you all have said it, but we've got to be very cognizant that uh, what we develop or what we uh, come together with, we've got to think about generations later on. And so uh, Lucy mentioned it in terms of reparations. In ter There's so many different things uh, that we must be aware of and, and, and make sure also that we understand uh, that we're in a time period where I think a black America has been hurting for a very long time. Um, but we're at a time period where it has come to a sort of a head is formed. And now, you know, we, we see the, the various things of the, the tip of the iceberg. We see the various things that we've uh, seen at some points in America uh, and around the world. But now we're at a place where it's boiling over, uh, which is causing a lot of us to really sort of wake up and, you know, if you will, throw the cold water in our face and say, hey, we, we, we're, we've got too much going on uh, to where we, we can't uh, make progress. And we've got to be those who really, as we're doing here today, uh, come together and do that. But it, I really, again, think that uh, all change begins at the grassroots level mm -hmm. so, in our neighborhoods. Oh, I'm sorry. Definitely agree. But I also, I also, and I also think that at this time and where our country is positioned right now that we have to be bold. Um, bolder probably than we've ever been before. And that means that we cannot continue to tiptoe and skirt around issues um, that are, are very present and very, you know, oftentimes will hit us these microaggressions that, I, that women of color especially face oftentimes in the workplace and in corporate America and education. I think it's time that we have to call those things out and we have to begin to really name them so that people know that this is happening. And then if, if it's like almost like an illness, if you don't admit that you have some kind of illness, then you never can begin to repair it. So when we see these things happening in society, we have to continue to be bold and call it out and not let just this just be a movement that fades away. And so I think that's something that's all in our individual power to be able to do when we see things that are systemic or systematic um, and we see it happening, whether in our own organizations or in an organization that maybe we sit on the board for, if we are in a position of power, we have to call those things out. 
-hmm. So I wanted to add that, you know, our respective memberships in our, uh, in our organizations, um, for me, membership in Delta Sigma Theta uh, signifies me as someone who's educated. And yeah. that's not, that's all of us, right? And I think that's what uh, Faith was referencing when she says that's our power. You know, as um, Ada referenced, the biggest challenge African-Americans have in this country, I believe is education. You know, yes, I, yes, I put reparations up there, but education is the biggest thing. So when you go back to the question of what can we do without laws, um, learn the laws that already exist. That's the first thing. That's educating yourself. So, and I, what, when I say that, I mean things like, for example, COVID is shining a very bright light on all the cracks in this society, right? Yep. And so they passed the PPE program and who didn't get anything, right? Largely minority businesses. A lot of them were not set up properly to take advantage of it. Um, as someone who does work in that area, you know, I had a number of clients who were able to take advantage of it, but they were properly structured. And we know a lot of people in our backgrounds, families, friends who are quote unquote entrepreneurs. So for me, what I take on as other people have referenced is making sure that in my lane, the people I encounter, I set them up properly. You know, if you're a minority business, you, you should be certified as such so that the law that says 30% of all government contracts go to minorities, you can take advantage of, you know, or, you know, you have access to someone who does CPA work and bookkeeping and make sure that you are a recognized entity. So I'm speaking from my point of view, which is as a lawyer, we're oftentimes we simply don't know what is already here that we can take advantage of. And I mean that in the realm of law or anywhere else, There's a, there are things that we can take advantage of. And for me, speaking for me, I can help in that way. Um, and so- I was, I, about to ask, I, I was about to ask you, Lucy. I was about to ask you that. Uh-huh. Go ahead. <laughs> no, and so- <laughs> Yeah, and so, you know, so, I mean, because it's, it's it, even as myself, you know, I went to law school, but no one taught me anything about business. I'm not a businesswoman, I'm a lawyer, you know? So, I mean, when I started my own practice, I was like, oh, so I'm the marketer, I'm the bookkeeper, I'm the custodian, and the, I didn't realize all of these things. We lack mentors, we lack people. I mean, in addition to not having the generational wealth, what generational wealth means is that there was a model. Someone showed you how to do that, how to get there. So a lot of us, myself included, you know, simply are learning by ourselves. We're like individual, you know, individual. And again, that's the legacy of slavery, divide and conquer. We don't see ourselves as a collective. And I come from a culture where there is no I, it's we. You know, so we have to be willing to lend of ourselves and occupy our respective lanes in a masterful way because our legacy as uh, black, black Greek letter organizations is that of education. We are, the ability for us to simply go and find out and educate is very easy for us, you know? And so that's, that's my biggest thing. I can't sit here and watch someone, anyone I encounter, I will ear hustle. If I hear someone discussing, I will let them know, oh, you just started a business here. Here's my business card. Call me and I will walk you through how you become incorporated, how you take advantage of tax breaks. My tax guy does uh, pro bono work. Those are the things we have to be able to do or willing to do, or we're not going to go anywhere. So in terms of what we can do without laws, one, figure out what's already on the books that you can take advantage of and then lend of yourself, you know? So that's, that's my answer. I think mm -hmm. Lucy, that lending of ourself, that's where it comes into what organizations you belong to, to begin to ask them, if you're on a board for somewhere and you notice that a lot of the higher hires don't look like us, right? Where's our diversity plan? Or if we notice that a lot of the vendors aren't vendors that are, are, our, are vendors that represent people that are black, then what are we doing to diversify our vendors? Are we making sure that when we go out to bid that our contracts are, you know, we lowered the threshold for insurance, which we know many minority owned companies, sometimes they can't carry a high threshold of insurance. They just don't have that kind of power, right? So do we lower that? 
for bid? Do we make sure that when we're putting out bid specs that we have made it most advantageous to women and, and folks of color by making sure that maybe the number of jobs that they've done that exceeded several million dollars is not as high. Maybe they have a job instead that was just 500,000, right? So that when you're crafting what these specs look like, we can make sure that our people have a seat at the table. Because now it's one thing to make sure that they're set up correctly. And then it's another thing to create that seat at the table for them. I don't know, like the, my charter school, oftentimes when I walked into the door as our chief academic officer, the majority of our vendors were folks that don't look like the kids that we service. And I'm like, well, to our board, what's our diversity plan to diversify what our vendors look like? How are we gonna begin to craft bid specs that are more open so that people of color and women can come sit at these tables with us? So that has to be intentional work. And in order to make that kind of intentional work happen, those of us who, who have arrived at the table or maybe just having to have our tiptoe at the table, we have to be bold enough to ask how do we begin to make this happen for other folks? And then remind those folks that we make it happen for, guess what? Now I, I have a responsibility. This, and this is your obligation to help somebody else along the way. And so we don't do that often enough. I totally agree with Lucy. We haven't been mentored mm -hmm. enough by other people to do that. But now we're at a place, guess what? We shouldn't have to be mentored that much if it's not there and we've learned along the way what to do. We have to just keep moving forward. And I'm sorry if you hear my one year old, but it's- I wanna jump in. Uh, uh -oh. in. Go ahead, and, Doug. And uh, I wanna <laughs> say to that, to that uh, the second question, uh, I was speaking with one of my frat brothers and we're getting together his good brother by the name of Stephen Webb. And one of the things that we talked about is that we have to become shareholders. Yeah. Uh, we have to look at this whole thing uh, corporately. Each organization, and for that matter, each person in their community has to look at things from a shareholder's perspective. And we have to go to our elected officials and almost do a report card for them. We have to give them uh, what we want, what we want to see, and, 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 and drop a plan for them. And then we have to hold them to that because at the end of the day, they're the ones that push the legislation. And a lot of times what happens is that we elect someone and then we forget about them. We don't pay attention to how they're voting for us, what they're pushing, and then all of a sudden things pop up and we go, hey, well, how did this happen? So we have to start building a report card and an agenda of what we're talking about. And it might vary from location to location. It might be different here in LA than it is in Alabama put these things together through our organizations. Because again, going back to what Faith and I said earlier, they're, we, they're strength in numbers. We, we are forces to be reckoned with. And uh, as uh, Lucy said, we're educated. So we're not, you know, and that's, that's not to demean anything. We're not coming, you know, from a gang banger point of view or whatever. We're coming from an educated standpoint of people who are actively involved in our, communi in our communities who are concerned about our children. So when we put those agendas together, we come, we see who, who is going to, uh, carry out our agendas, we vote for that person, and then we do a, 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 a twice a month report card. Hey, has this been taken care of? How are you doing on this? And if they can't fulfill our agendas, then we get somebody out. Because one thing elected officials respect, our vote. And yeah. that's where our power is, our vote. And it's, it's Doug. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, Ty. Ada, Ada. One, one, of the, one of the best things that you did, uh, Faith, with, with uh, grown, grown, grown and Greeks is to bring the divine nine together like this. Mm -hmm. And we're speaking about the issues that need to be spoken about. And one of the things that we should do within our communities and our local communities is to do things like this. Yeah. Bring the divine nine together, not just socially, but, um, but to discuss <clears throat> issues and to work together with issues like we did when we were undergrads in college with the Panhellenic Council. Mm -hmm. We need to do that more. And then bring back what our individual organizations are doing and, and do them collectively, because like Faith said, there is power in numbers. Yeah, I like to add on that point um, about uh, number one, two things, legislation, and then the other point that Faith um, brought up about what can we do uh, without law. Um, so first of all, when we think about legislation, uh, number one, we're talking about legislation and law that um, the system is designed to oppress us, to oppress Black African Americans. I mean, the system was never built um, to be fair, you know, towards us. So when we think about tackling like the issue of legislation and law and policy, um, that is definitely, it's a big, 
you know what I'm saying, it's going to be a big undertaking to tackle. I mean, I do understand and agree that number one, it does start at the local level. Um, and many times African Americans are not participating, Black people are not participating in local level elections. So, I mean, that has to be, you know, key in order for us to be able to have some type of power and control as it relates to how our communities are managed um, under uh, local legislation. So that's first and foremost. But when I think about the root of the problem with um, everything that we've discussed, um, going back to COVID-19, going back to, you know, this current economic crisis, and then also with the protests and everything, you know, my lens, the, the root of the problem is, is economics. Um, it is the racial wealth gap. Um, when you peel back all the layers of the onion, um, it all boils down to the dollar. And when we think about what can we control without law, that's one area that you know we really need to put our emphasis on is controlling our dollar. When you think about Black people, we have 1.3 you know trillion dollar buying power in this country, yet we have the least tangible amount of wealth under any social economic group. Mm -hmm in this country. So we have to control our dollar. There is no power without ownership, no matter how you chop it, no matter who's in law, and no matter what legislation is on table on the table. If there is no if there is no ownership, there is no power. Um, so we have to shift our focus. Um, and 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 really it, it's a lot for us to manage, but we really do have to shift our focus and put a lot of focus focus on the dollar, on building economic sustainability, on uh, building um, wealth within our communities. And that has to start obviously uh, earlier, going back to the education standpoint, has to start earlier with our youth, but that ownership is gonna be key for us because there is gonna be, there's no power without that. And in regards to asking for the seat at the table, I'm more so with the approach of building our own tables. Um, you know, we're at a place right now where we've been begging and asking for things for a very long time. And I think it's time for us to start taking control over our own money. And if they're not going to give us a seat at the table, then we just, we build our own. Yeah, I want to address this whole idea um, about, I mean, I think that the conversation is great about emphasizing um, economic wealth and, and again, building that table um, based on the economic resources and, and, and marshalling those resources. But I want to address something that's a little bit more uncomfortable for us in the D9. And that is part of just having a conversation with um, class dynamics and the socioeconomic divide that actually exists within our organizations as well, but also within our broader communities. For example, I live in uh, Forest Park, Georgia, which the family income is probably averaged around uh, about $28,000 a year. So we're actually talking about one of the more impoverished areas um, in Atlanta where people who have been gentrified and leaving the city of Atlanta, right, um, that's, actually, uh, that's actually in the hands of black power, now they reside here. Um, and one of the things that, you know, the question that comes up constantly um, in, in conversations I'm having with my colleagues um, is, you know, why do I live here? You know, why do I choose to live in Forest Park? And part of it, too, is just we talk about economic capital a lot. Um, but in talking about education and cultural capital, one of the things that we need to be um, is seen. We need to be seen in, in the way that August Wilson um, wrote in the, in the ground in which I stand, where he actually told whites, um, in theater that he wanted us to be seen, not when they see us, right? Because those young men still went to jail. But what I'm talking about is we need to be seen as a presence in communities of color where people do not have our socioeconomic background, right? And they do not look like us. They need to understand that representation of success is possible, not the way that we see it in Black America. We usually see success in Black America by individual names, right? We call them Tyler or Robert Smith or someone of that right, of that caliber, which then reinforces this individualism, right, that Lucy talked about. And this whole idea of the American dream narrative that, again, allows some of us to succeed as Black people, even within our own organizations, at the expense of others. And I think that that is something that, again, we have to constantly work towards dismantling, but also, right, providing that cultural capital where our our young people, but most importantly, our people, regardless of their socioeconomic status, start to see themselves in entertainment, in the political system, in financial services, in education, right? And then create those pipelines to where we can bring others along with the same sense of purpose and agency then leads us to the ballot box. One of the things that I realized here um, in Forest Park, as we were voting on Tuesday, was that all of the volunteers, right, were um, probably of 60, um, 60 years and above, right? They were older volunteers. So the, then the question becomes that this is a predominantly African American community, and our elected officials, right, um, are most ran unopposed. So they, so again, there were no no challengers, no younger challengers to that power structure. So then the question becomes, where are we? 
right? And I'm also holding myself accountable when we're talking about this. So I think one of the conversations that we need to have within our organizations is really that. Where are we? Where do we want to be? How do we plan on empowering communities, right? And then where are we in physically? Are we physically a part of the, the communities where Demetrius will say the least of these reside? Right, because our presence means so much. It's not always about our economic power as much as it is about our physical presence, right? Because they will listen to little Yachty, they will listen to little baby, right? But they need to see us as well. Right. If I can respond um, to Lavar's point and also answer the question about what do we do when there's besides legislation? So share information. And to his point about being present, being seen as a public defender and as one of three female public defenders of color on the Eastern Shore of Maryland and the only public defender in Kentucky, in Northern Kentucky, it wasn't my job just to get through the cases, but to educate while I got through the cases. So we don't show up for jury, jury duty. And I had to explain to my, my clients how that hurt us. And it's one thing to get on social media and explain your frustration but you can also do that when you show up for duty, jury duty in a trial. <clears throat> the other part was explaining the process because court on TV is not court in real life. And so learning the difference between an encounter versus a stop, you know, explaining those nuances from the legal standard and how you apply this in your day-to-day -day life, that's information that I have as a professional. That's information I knew and learned growing up in, in the streets, sharing that information. That's what we do when there's no legislation. We share what we know. And for me, I always describe being a criminal defense attorney as a game. It was a game that's designed for me to lose. Prosecutor, judge, everything is stacked against me when I enter into that courtroom. But the difference is, as Lucy alluded to in her first point, I knew and I learned how to play the game very well. So if we're sharing that information and we're empowering and equipping our communities with the tools to play the game. Yeah, and Latoya, right. that is a great I, point. Yeah. Because I'm sorry, I just have to jump in there. That is, that. I just have to jump in. That is the most critical thing. Lovely. When you give someone, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Todd, but when you give someone, when you educate someone, when you change the course of their life, yeah. I have so many clients who come in who don't understand the impact of being termed an independent contractor versus employee and what the long-term impact is that on your social security when you are not getting anything, just the edu just education, you know? And so I, I, that's the only point I wanted to make is if you can simply just open your mouth and tell someone something, mm -hmm. you may have done more than anything else that anyone else could have done, done for them. I'd like to add, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just want to add one thing about- well, Jump about, in. Just about <laughs> education, <laughs> about education in its primal form. One of the conversations I was having with another parent is the misconception about Black Lives Matter. Now, I know that in some communities, and in particular in the South, and in particular in Black uh, schools, teachers are talking about Black Lives Matters, but they're not doing it in, in a broader sense. So people don't know, they think that Black Lives Matter is only about uh, uh, fighting police officers and police brutality, but it's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're talking about how it's leaderless and they don't have anybody, you know, that's really in the forefront. And it's just really, you know, about uh, uh, violence, but they don't know that there's 40, about 47 chapters across the country. And they don't know that they're working with about 50 different organizations to discuss about 50 different topics and different issues that affect the Black and Latino community. So why aren't this being taught in classes? Why isn't it a demand that all these teachers teach Black you know, history in the way it should be taught? And I think, Ada, to your point, um, so we have to look at what our teaching force is. Um, our teaching force is about 80% Caucasian. Um, and I lead a, a school. And I'm, I'm not happy to say that the majority of my teachers are, cauc are cauc Caucasian, but our school is 60% um, uh, Latino and 40% African American. So we come to this place and, and now the issue of the day is 
what's happening in our country. And we redesigned our curriculum a few years ago to be more culturally competent, right? Or culturally relevant. And the teachers were having a really hard time teaching it because we were having discussions about redlining when our students were reading The Death of a Salesman, right? Because we couldn't have them read this book about a middle-aged white man and then not talk about where our lived experiences were positioned at this time while this book was being written. But I literally had teachers that were scared and coming to my office crying about having to teach this material. So, you know, now we're moving at a faster speed and we had to do some diversity training that went hand in hand with rolling out our curriculum because we had folks that didn't look like us in classroom with student, classrooms with students that looked like us and they weren't really ready or who those students were by having to talk about issues that were painful for them. You know, they were okay to just breeze through and, and do the general talking about slavery and, you know, where we were as Black people at that time, but not to really do the hard work and talk about the system, systemic and systematic issues that have affected us as a people. So I think, one, we have to also have that conversation while we're educating our students how do we make sure that the workforce and how do we recruit? I know we've had to go back and start thinking, how do we be more intentional and not violate any equal employment opportunity laws by recruiting folks of color, right? But how do we intentionally go to HBCUs to recruit teachers? And then how do we make sure that the financial package of compensation is set up in a way that our teachers can afford to come and teach at our school because we're trying to supply them a, a housing stipend or just making it advantageous for them because our teachers normally, or teachers of color, normally we come out of school, we have student loan debt, we have all these other obligations that someone else who's had a little bit of privilege may not come out of school with the same kind of debt. Not that they don't at times, but it, it just doesn't happen as much. So they have the luxury of coming out of school and then saying, you know what? I'm going to go teach for a few years. I'm going to live at home with my parents. We don't always have that luxury. Right. So how do we make sure that we're intentional as school systems to, to recruit teachers of color um, in, a, in a way that is very thoughtful to who these teachers are and what their needs are? And I want to speak to the tune of the education side, what our kids are seeing, and then also um, – with the generations to come, we have to invest in those things so that way they can see people outside of their community as well. So, and I, and I say that because we mentor at a school system. We, we mentor here in the Birmingham city schools, but when we mentor in the school system that's outside of Birmingham or in outside of Jefferson County and Walker County, it's a predominantly white school system. So we're allowing young white kids, we're allowing the few black kids, the few Hispanic kids to see African-Americans in a different light. So when they see black lives, they see educated black men coming to their facility. We have a, uh, we have a white brother in our chapter that's at the schools with us. But at the same time, when these kids grow up and, know, and they're, they're going to, of course, going to be a pro product of um, their community. But what they're raised and what they're taught and what they're being fed is totally different than what they're seeing. And kids are now looking at things on a broader spectrum. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we have to make sure that we're doing it in our school systems. But then if our kids are in the so-called affluent school system outside of the black community, we got to make sure that those kids in those schools are seeing us. <laughs> They got to start seeing more of us, and they can't wait to see a rapper on TV. They can't wait to see a violent show on TV. They can't wait to see cops because and um, live PD because predominantly, who are they going to see? Everything, you know, and, and of course, um, we see that they have something about racial profiling, that they're working on um, a law based, you know, to prevent the racial profiling with the police. It's going to be difficult. But at the same time, it's not that it can't be done. But my thing with that is, when it comes to the school system, we have to be those people that they're seeing. And um, I think also when it comes to the school system, when you go to those HBCUs, we have to make sure that you're painting a broad picture because a lot of times when you go to HBCU, yeah, you're gonna have a 95% African-American population 
but you have those that few that will attend the HBCU that are not of color. So then we have to also make sure we find ways to include them and be inclusive of them. So that way it doesn't say, oh, we're coming here to get all the black kids to work for us. No, we're coming to look at everyone. And then that way we paint that picture of, we are looking for someone to service our children based, not based on color creed or any of that, but based on the work. And then we have to let our work speak for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I had another point that I was going to bring back to you, Doug, but I done lost it. I want to talk about two quick things, if I don't mind. Um, It'll come back to you. I want to talk about two quick things, too. And I think that all of us, I mean, you know, especially all of us on this amazing panel um, are really talking about this and we go through this in our own work. And it's really just about questioning the own personal sacrifices that we're making. Um, to again engage in the uplifting education of our, of our people. And I think that that is vital. Um, that I think in many ways, one of the things that we have to ask ourselves in build, building this agenda for black people is what are we willing to sacrifice? And what I mean by that is, you know, for the young men that I teach at Morehouse every day, right? The history lesson is fine, but they want to see how this, re how this actually occurs in real time, right? So, you know, we're not talking about um, you know, respectability politics about how to dress, how to perform, how to speak well, right? They already are trained to be the best and brightest black men in America because that is the ethos of, of morals. What they're seeing in George Floyd is that none of that is actually working for them. Right. So it doesn't matter what school they go to, how well they perform, how well they're trained as lawyers. What they're realizing that is that this system has become more um, institutionally racist, but more insidious in terms of the violence that it puts on black bodies psychologically, physically, emotionally, economically than ever before. So one of the things that's very vital for me is that as an educator, that I am also taking the risk with my students to then also critically engage them on how this world is becoming the way it is and what are some of the strategies that we need to employ as a people to keep ourselves healthy, mentally, financially, politically engaged, but also right on that spiritual path. But also, too, this is something that we also need to go back to our organizations and have critical conversations with, right? If we're talking about Black Lives Matter and not talking about our gay brothers and sisters or our trans right, um, communities in terms of being engaged in a struggle against white supremacy that threatens all of us, then we're not really having critical conversations about where we need to go. Right. If we're not talking about um, looking back at history, and this is also something that we lose out in our social media environment. Right. We already have the agenda. The Black Panthers came with the 10 point program. Right. We already have the agendas in, in terms of looking back at history. What we're usually doing in social media is we're looking at that one meme or the the 20 second uh, snippet of history, right? Rather than really uncovering history and the strategies that we've used before, especially if we think about, right, the four little girls, if we think about Selma, if we think about Birmingham, if we think about this rich civil rights history, we already have the strategies of what empowerment looks like. We already have black banks. We can think about Citizens Trust or Carver Bank as examples of black empowerment. How many of us, including myself, actually invest in those banks? So part of it is just the rollback, right, into this deep, rich history of black and brown people that we've been here before, we've overcome before, right? Now, how do we push this forward? And most importantly, in the technological age, I'm being challenged in this way. How do I put it in a 20-minute snippet, right? Because that's the thing that I'm learning, right? Mm -hmm. In most of my classes, I think I have 20 minutes with all of my students before the, the lights go off, right? So now I'm being pushed as a professor to really show them how these things relate, right? To Todd's point, we cannot deny the fact that groups like Migos in our popular culture, right, resonates with our children. But the problem is who, who of us in our organizations is speaking to them? How are we bringing them to the table? as thought leaders, as ministers, as professionals, as educators, to then say, we need you to be responsible for the content that you deliver to our children. So then that way, empowerment kind of moves all around us. I think that, I think that is very uh, paramount, what you, what you just stated. And, and I wanted to sort of go back as we were talking about education and educating on different various things. I've sort of accepted the responsibility um, as a pastor 
to talk about things that are not just, uh, you know, Sunday morning uh, language, if you mm-hmm. will. Uh, I have accepted the responsibility that on Sundays, I will talk about what's happening in America to my people and to the folks that are watching. You know, I've also accepted the fact that uh, we, you know, it, it amazes me how many people don't really even understand or know about voting, period. Uh, what local uh, what local elected officials do. You know, people, uh, and just in general, not just in Black America, but just, I mean, in general, people don't realize um, the difference between a solicitor general or a district attorney. They don't realize what a commissioner does or what a city council person does or that some of the local issues that, that we're facing are dealt with at the local level. Right now, everyone's talking about the police issues. Well, I mean, who appoints police chiefs and who appoints a lot of those people? A lot of that, that's local. And so one of the responsibilities that I've accepted is that I'm going to educate anyone who wants to listen in my church about voting. And as well as ex-offenders, you know, uh, we had people in our church who were saying, well, hey, I commit, you know, I, I was uh, arrested for X, Y and Z. Can I vote? You know, it was my responsibility to help walk them through the process to make sure that they register to vote because they were eligible to vote. And, and, and to watch the, the level of pride that someone has when they feel like they participated in a process. Uh, well, in Georgia, you, you all saw our election this past <laughs> week. And so uh, obviously we got some issues, uh, but, but, but to just get people to understand the basics of the importance of that vote um, and the importance of not just the vote, but the history behind the vote and how we got to where we are. It really baffles me and really sort of crushes me to the core when I see uh, some of my millennial brothers and sisters who say they're not concerned about it, or not just millennial brothers and sisters, but anyone who says, oh, I don't vote because it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that because we can protest, we can stand out, and, and, and we all, Romans 8, 28 says what? All things work together. So we've got to do all of it. We can't just do some of it. We've got to do all of it. But at the same time, we've got to understand the importance that that vote carries. And as Doug said, get people at the table who are representative of the issues that we want to that we want to stand out that we want to call out and so there are a lot of current things that are still in place in local governments that are set up to not help us win if you will and we've got to have people at the table who will call those things out and say hey this is not right you know there's no reason why and i want to challenge everybody here i might get in trouble but it's cool there's no reason why a local government should not should have a minimum wage that's really low in a in a in a uh, predominantly you know minority community. We need to talk to our local governments and say, hey, raise the minimum wage there. Challenge the businesses in your area to do this because we've got to send a resounding message that the folks who are in power, which is not really us, the folks who are in power. We're going every one of these issues that we're standing up for. We're not just going to give lip service. There's, you know, talk is cheap and we've done enough lip service and it's time for us to put the feet to the fire and make the action happen. And we're doing that. We are doing that. So I'm not saying we're not, but we just got to be able to hold folks accountable. and make. That was my point. That was my point. Push back. I'm sorry. Push back against people who say hold the vote hostage. Mm -hmm. That is such a ridiculous talking point. I don't know why anyone is putting that out there. Again, you can't hold something hostage that you're not, you've never used, you know, you hold it hostage when it, when you were using it in the past. But if you are using it, that's when you, 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 you can speak like that. You, you are at the table asking for something because you've demonstrated in the past, the power of your vote. So this is an election year. I think we need to do, um, I think we need to do, you know, push back against narratives that take ourselves out of the conversation, such as withholding the vote. The election is going to happen without you. You know, someone is going to be elected president, whether you vote or not. So you might as well participate and then stay at the table and hold them accountable. Like um, Doug said, you have to go back. What are you doing? You know, yes, I voted for you, but I want to know what you're doing month after month after month so I can reassess my vote and see if you merit it a second time. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I know I just oh, finished got, talking, but I, got, hold on one second. Okay, so we, I'm sorry, have, we have, I'm sorry, Demetrius. We have, yeah. unless y'all want to go longer, we have, um, as I've allocated about 90 minutes for our conversation. So we can continue this 
the next time or we can we can continue this now. It's up to you. But um, we got about 10 minutes left and I, I wanted to make sure that you guys all had an opportunity to kind of tell um, and speak about what's going on in your your world and how we can help you in your uh, in your endeavors. So um, go ahead and y'all let me know if you want to stop or if we, if we need to keep on going because this is this is good. You're giving me a lot of homework. I'm and, going uh, first. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I mean, the, alph the alphas were Demetrius, first, so if I'm you would like to go first. <laughs> Demetrius, we're not going to do that. Uh, you giving, uh, giving me some homework, but this is, this is very, I, I, I had a feeling that this was going to be really good, um, but it was even better than what I anticipated um, because what has hit me is, you know, we're looking for leaders, right? There, there's not one person who is leading the charge with what's going on right now. But what it seems, it's clear to me, is that we're all leaders. We, who says it has to be, um, you know, it has to come from one person's desk and, and one person um, is, is the, you know, the, 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 the guy or the girl that strikes the, you know, the, the iron to says, this is how we're gonna move and this is how we're gonna operate. It doesn't have to be like that, you know, but at the same time, we do need to, I think, speak with a collective voice and, you know, operate with a collective heart. And um, that's, that's what this conversation is showing me is that we, you know, by us coming together, it's a lot of things that we're all um, inspired by, but it's a lot of work that we um, just need to continue to put our heads together um, to, to be able to do. And so um, anyway, now I've taken up two, two minutes. So we have like eight minutes left. <laughs> Let the work that I've done speak well, go, go for ahead, me. Todd. That's, 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 that's what we have to do. Let the work that we've done speak for us. And then the work that we're gonna do speak for us. And um, there were three of you, I think it was Demetrius, Doug, and Lucy, and four actually, because <laughs> LeVar hit it too. The point here is we have got to start holding these elected officials accountable. It's accountability. We have to move from the photo ops and holding them accountable and pushing them to do their job. Okay, so what? It's gonna be two years. So what is gonna be four years before we can vote you out? But guess what? You best darn well believe that when the polls open next time, we're gonna be there. We talk about our national, but it's gonna start here at the grassroots level. The local community is where we're gonna make the most impact because if we're pushing people from our communities up to do the job that's needed, that's needed, then it can be done. But if we continue to sit back and what you, uh, Lucy, you said, hold the vote hostage, you, you're not benefiting the people. So, and you're not benefiting your community. And as a civil servant, you're obligated. As a civil servant, you're obligated for jury duty and you're obligated to vote because there's okay, too many Todd, people that Todd, call for the rights. Todd, okay, okay. now go from, go from there and at, um, uh, let's, let's go around um, and tell us what you got going on in your industry, what you got oh. going on in your life, how we can help uh, you as the D9 and um, yeah, go. And then I'm, I'm gonna uh, go around the <laughs> or do a round robin on this <laughs> me starting with me you. all right yeah. um right now with uh pi epsilon sigma chapter here in birmingham we are actually just continuous, continuously trying to stay involved with the community um during the COVID. we know that it um interaction is limited but we're just pushing brothers to stay involved personally but um from you all we have our um we have our sickle cell that we're working on. Um, you can catch that on my page. I'm going to be posting something for sickle cell here in Central Alabama. We know that African Americans are impacted by sickle cell, and we want to make sure to support sickle cell as much as possible. And of course, um, there's, there's so much more we have. I'm trying to think, Faith, uh, but definitely right. sickle cell is one of the things that we're pushing. And then, of course, I am running for state director of Phi Beta Sigma here in the state of Alabama. So for any of you that have any Sigma family and friends, make sure that they know that we are going to move the state and we're going to move within the D9 as we should. So shout out to everybody that's on here because some great things coming and um, just thank you, um, 
faith, chocolate, whatever you want to be called today for just having this vision. You and Russ, thank you all. Lucy. Shout out to my sister. Up. Shout out to my sister, Latoya. Blue, Faye. <laughs> we're going gonna to get to that too before we, we all jump off too. Lucy, you got it. Okay, so um, one thing I've really uh, dedicated myself and I had a lot of plans this year before the advent of COVID to really dedicate myself on was to educate um, my community about employment rights. As we've all spoken about here, um, African-Americans largely as a group, we, we don't own much in this country. So a lot of times what we own is our job. I mean, that literally gets us from week to week to week. You cannot have an elevated conversation with someone who hasn't eaten, who has children who haven't eaten, who've been, who's been laid off. There's the practical aspect of this conversation. People need to protect what they already have or they feel the need to protect it. So in my, in my lane, I encounter a lot of people who um, have their employment taken away or impacted in, um, in, in, in ways that are just horrendous. And a lot of people do not look at, um, don't look at employment law as civil rights, but they are civil rights cases. Um, this the only area of law you have to go to the EEOC to get a right to sue. You know, it's set up so that, you know, you don't bring down a corporation with your one claim, even if it's a horrible one claim, you know. So my goal, um, and I've actually, I'm uh, about to do a webinar on, you know, titled, you know, what do you not know about your job? Simple as that. It's on my uh, Instagram, Lucy Law, um, and I'm uh, writing the content for that um, just to educate people, simple things that you would probably that we all know as professionals here. But a lot of people don't know. So by the time they come to me and say I've been fired, you know, or I've been this, I've been demoted, I've been put on suspension, and I say, okay, let's have a conversation about how we got here. The company has hit A, B, C, D. And I know what the elements are to make out a case. And I'm like, they got you. You know what I'm saying? If you had done this here, I could have helped you if you had done this there. So I don't want people coming to me desperate. I want people coming to me armed so that I can get them what they came to me for. It's a horrible feeling to see someone devastated by an employment action and know you, you know, you, that day in court might not turn out the way that it should. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you. BZ, you got it. Yeah, so um, again, Brandy Avery and uh, the lane that I come from, again, is the racial wealth gap. Um, again, I strongly believe and I know that that is the root of all of this. Um, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. Um, and until we get our finances in order as a group, as a, uh, as a group of individuals, we will not have power in the United States of America because this is a capitalist society, um, no, no matter how you chop it. Um, so um, my organization is Keys to Black Wealth. Um, what we do, we are a, a multimedia edutainment brand. Um, we actually partner with, we've had conversations here, we partner with celebrities, entertainers um, from all across the globe who are also thought leaders in this movement. Um, we have an event coming up Juneteenth, um, June 19th, 20th, and 21st weekend. It's a virtual event, which is the Keys to Black Wealth Virtual Summit. We partner with Master P, Romeo, Ray J, Willie Norwood, Lisa Ray, Amarosa, um, Sean Ross, the name goes on and on and on. And we have over 40 plus speakers and the whole essence of that weekend is going to be delivering the keys to black wealth. Um, so it's gonna be an action packed weekend. It's all about delivering the keys to economic mobility um, as it relates to the black community. Again, without ownership, there is no power in the United States of America. So even with all of these laws that we're talking about, all the education under the sun, this is a capitalist society. So we have to be able to position ourselves to have ownership so that we can have power. And then when we have power, we'll be able to get some things accomplished. So I definitely invite you all. Um, I invite you all, um, Lucy Law, I would love to talk to you um, as well as other uh, others um, off the offline um, exchange information. But definitely I encourage you all um, to go check out Keys to Black Wealth on our Instagram page. We're doing some phenomenal things as it relates to giving up the keys to Black Wealth so that people can position <laughs> themselves to own land um, so that they can position themselves to have power in this country so that we can get some things accomplished. Um, I do believe that we have the power as individuals um, to get this job done and then to be able to come together as a collective power and to be able to leverage our $1.3 trillion of wealth in this country so that we can have some respect 
um, at the end of the day, that's where we are. Um, that's where we are in this country. And um, until we position ourselves like this, I believe that it's going to be a constant uphill battle. Thank you, B. Thank you, B. Thank you. Uh, Ada, Doug, you got the mic. So, you know, we are in the entertainment field, obviously, you know. Um, uh, one of the things that we're currently doing is um, pitching a few of our projects that really talk directly uh, to telling our stories um, in the way that we want to tell them by us. Because can't nobody tell your story better than you. Um, so you want to add to that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so we also, uh, what we're doing too is that we, whenever we're in production, we also uh, do a mentoring program. We have a uh, young filmmakers program. So we always uh, look to uh, hire interns. Uh, we hire- uh, We give credit, we, uh, we, we give scholarships. Um, we, we build communication skills, um, resume writing. Uh, one of the things that that's a huge problem in Hollywood, well, one of the many huge things is that um, many kids of color are not being hired who are in these film schools are not being hired by these uh, huge networks. So what we tend to do is, you know, teach them how, how to play the game, you know, because there is a game to be played and you have to learn <laughs> the game. The other thing that we are doing right now is that we've, we've, we've uh, built a small coalition of people of color to to empower us behind the scenes. And that includes the voting power. A lot of times you don't see people of color uh, even being nominated who have been thrown in the pot for Emmys and Oscars. But the, but the reason that we're not being nominated is because there are not enough of us voting and we're not enough of us are members. So we need to empower ourselves by becoming filmmakers, by becoming writers, by becoming you know members of the voting rights. So this is the coalition that we're building and we're always welcoming uh, more, more people to, to, to build up, up like I said, this power, in, there's num there's power in numbers. That's it. That's uh, what we're doing. So uh, it's DNA Media. <laughs> we didn't even say that. DNA Media Productions. Uh, that's the name of our company. And uh, hopefully we'll be in production soon on uh, one of the projects that we're pitching right now. Mr. McCoy, you have the mic, sir. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, I just want to say that we've come this far, but it's close to Sunday, so I'm just getting prepared. All right, preacher. <laughs> but we've Go come ahead. this far by it's faith. The amen quarter right here. <laughs> yes, we've come this far by faith, and our faith has moved us into action. And now it is my prayer that our action leads us into progress, and that as we continue to do what we're doing, uh, that we continue to make strides. And so uh, I'm going to continue to focus, my church and I will continue to focus on uh, meeting some of the most basic needs that people have, and that's just trying to feed the babies that my wife teaches who may not have anything to eat. Uh, it, it's focused on trying to encourage our, our folks to, to get out there and to vote and to make sure that it's fair, as well as uh, to, to trying to encourage everyone uh, as far as COVID-19 to make sure we have the resources in our communities as with testing sites. Um, and, you know, just, just continue to uplift our community. And so, again, thank you for this opportunity. And it has been a pleasure to serve on this discussion with all of you all uh, who are very, I'm telling you, I'm just, I, I'm just honored to be am amongst you all uh, because of who you are, what you offer uh, as a human being. So thank you. Miss Bell. <laughs> so, I trans thank you. I tr thank you for inviting me again. Thank you for having me part of this brain trust. This was wonderful. Um, I transitioned from the courtroom a year ago, but my commitment to justice has not stopped. And our social action committee of my chapter is hosting a virtual town hall on June 27th. And people here talked a lot about accountability. So I called to the table our police chief. I've called um, former, former municipal court judge, Annan Rucker, who is now running for the prosecutorial seat in our county, which would, if he wins, make him the first man of color to occupy that seat and probably the first Democrat to occupy that seat. I have David Singleton from the Ohio Justice and Policy Center, who was instrumental in getting Tyra Patterson released, and another community grassroots organizer, Iris Rowley. So, We'll be doing virtual town halls to make sure that while summer is here, we're still keeping people informed and engaged. <laughs> we have another one, another one planned for July, and that's covering everything you need to know about voting. So that's what I have coming up. 
Thank you, Madam. Dr. Smith. <laughs> First of all, thank you for just allowing me to uh, be on such an amazing platform. I feel like I'm a student of all of you, and I hope that that will continue. Um, my work is primarily as an academic. One of the things that we kind of get caught in is the ivory tower. So one of the things that I'm learning from you all is how to transcend that. It's great to have ideas, but also implement them in practice. Um, <clears throat> so what I've been doing actually is working with groups like Plant the Seed International, which was um, an organization started by two men that actually exposes um, African-American people and people throughout the diaspora to Africa, primarily Liberia, West Africa. Um, we've also, um, uh, uh, through Morehouse, developed some programs where um, our college students um, also in other communities of color also exposed to other parts of Africa in terms of um, South Africa and also Senegal and, and Ghana exclusively. Um, again, this is core to my research growing up in Oakley, California is the whole idea, um, as Lucy talked about, that it is not I, but it is a we community making sure that um, African Americans um, as young as possible um, are actually exposed to the continent, understand the possibilities that exist globally. Um, so right now, just developing the initial thoughts around a, a youth-based curriculum, uh, focusing on eighth to 12th graders um, about just international affairs, global politics, but also Africa largely. Um, still doing work at Morehouse with the Oprah Winfrey Scholars, um, being able to expand the reach of HBCUs um, within their communities. For those who went to HBCUs, you know that our um, representation and creating our narrative and telling our story to our younger people um, is something that we desperately need to do. So we've done that and started to do that um, in a more systemic fashion. Um, we think about Brown Middle School in the West End neighborhood, but also Washington, Booker T. Washington High School, um, because again, we want to start to make sure that our voice is being heard and that our students um, just within all of these communities continue to push the narrative of Black agency forward and Black excellence forward. Um, and create our own narratives. So those are just some of the things that I'm doing. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Miss West. Oh, and there's Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> so Danielle, you got you got the mic. Yes. Um, so currently, um, I am working with our school. Well, working uh, with our school to expand our footprint. Um, as we just in February received a DOE approval to expand to the 12th grade. So we will be a K through 12 school system. Um, so we are presently also working with the developer to create something akin to um, a teacher's village that's located in Newark where I, we can actively go and really recruit folks and have a housing package um, provided for the teachers that we do recruit. So that's on the school side. And then on the personal side, they often say that um, the things that are affecting you in life lead to birth other things. Um, I recently started a, a curated conversations for moms um, because I am the mom of a one year old and a relatively still new wife as well. So um, being in this space and being in this space during a time of COVID, I am learning an awful lot. <laughs> I'm also learning that you need a network and in needing that network, um, we started or I just woke up one morning and said, there has to be other moms that are going through this issue. So I started this uh, Facebook group that also turned into an Instagram group as well. It's called Mommy Wind Down. Uh, we had our first curated conversation is for professional working moms that are trying to manage and juggle it all um, just to have a support network and support group around them. Uh, with regards to um, the community, Front, through our school, I'm also moving forward with the community to provide some of those very basic needs. We've partnered with some local organizations in Plainfield, New Jersey, uh, where my school is located, to provide food and some of those basic necessities during COVID because we've noticed that a lot of our families have been experiencing food insecurity around this time. So we've done uh, grocery food drops, once a month for our families. Um, we're trying to increase that to be two times a month, as well as working to provide our students uh, lunch every day because we're still serving lunch to our students during this time of COVID. So those are some of the things that are happening personally and professionally uh, for me. Uh, Miss Lily, are you there? Hey, y'all, I am such a bad panelist, so y'all have to forgive me. Um, hey, everybody, I've had so much stuff going on today. 
Um, I don't know where y'all are right now. Um, I think someone just texted me and just said, um, what am I working on in the community? But yes, yeah, my name is Meredith Lilly. I know almost everybody on this panel. Um, and it is good to see everybody in one space. And I will have to get all the notes from someone uh, later on. But uh, full time, I'm the director of external affairs for one of our largest counties, uh, one of our blackest counties in the state of Georgia. Um, so I work with the community on a daily basis because I am the liaison between my boss and 700,000 residents um, in DeKalb County. So I have to hear uh, everything all day from our constituents. So uh, that's that's number one. But in the evenings, uh, most times I am working on campaigns. I have campaigns right now in Charlotte, um, a, North, a congressional campaign that I'm working on, advising on in Charlotte and I have several campaigns in the Atlanta area. So I am a campaign person. So usually I spend my evenings on Zoom calls, on calls all night and fundraising calls. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I really want um, us to do more as, as black people, and I guess we can add this to the black agenda, is to get behind our, our elected officials financially more. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that's needed. And uh, we have to, even if it's five or $10, it costs so much to run a campaign. And I don't think people really uh, realize how much uh, it costs to run a daily or a local campaign. And all, can all politics start local. I tell people that all the time. It's just not the presidential campaign, but it's, it's local politics that's very important. So I would encourage people to just start giving um, to some of the uh, people that's running locally. Uh, but in terms of how grown and Greek can help. I think using this platform to encourage people to, to vote, and we have to take it uh, past voting because when I looked at the numbers and I pulled the numbers uh, from the last presidential uh, campaign, we had hundreds of thousands of people who were registered to vote that did not go out and vote. Um, so it's, it's going a step further uh, than registering people to vote. Everybody want to register people to vote, but it's more important for us to get those registered voters out. We have plenty of people that's registered. Um, we just got to get those people out to vote. So I think using this platform to encourage people to go and actually vote and then having people be responsible for 30 people. Everybody knows 30 people. So you can get 30 people to the polls um, um, and then ask those people to get more people to the polls, then that would be wonderful.